you're sitting where there's no pew in front of you. Proverbs is located immediately after the book of Psalms and right before the book of Ecclesiastes. So if you're having trouble finding it, you can go ahead and find it there. Proverbs 31 is the last chapter in the book of Proverbs, and we're going to be looking at verses 10 through 31 this morning as I begin a series called The Not-So-Modern Family. I've entitled it because we need to understand what the biblical family is and not what Hollywood and anyone else would tell you what the modern family is supposed to look like. So over the next six weeks, what we are going to do is we are going to take a look at each member of the family and we're going to see what the Bible has to say, not what society has to say about what our duties, our responsibilities, and how we are supposed to be biblical examples for those that are around us. Because, folks, your friends, your neighbors, your kids, your relatives, all they have to do is turn on the TV set, and guess what? Hollywood is going to tell them what their version of a modern family is supposed to look like. Whether it's a television show entitled Modern Family, or whether it's a television show entitled Playing House, or whether it's a television show entitled Sister Wives, or My Five Wives, or whatever the case might be, Hollywood is going to attempt to dictate to them what a family is supposed to look like. Folks, as followers of Christ, it is our responsibility to study God's Word and to reflect it to this society. We are called to be beacons of light in darkness. We are called to be salt. We are called to be His witness and His testimony that others would come to know Christ as Lord and Savior. Therefore, we need to understand how God defines what a family is. How God defines what it means to be a dad. How God defines what it means to be a son and a daughter. That's right, kids. You're not getting off easy, okay? It means you too. Today, we are going to begin by looking at the not-so-modern mom. Now, if I was to ask some folks who their least favorite individual in the Bible might be, I would probably have some ladies come up to me and say, that Proverbs 31 woman is not my favorite, okay? (laughs) Uh, Can I get an amen from there? Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, because Proverbs 31, it's like, you know... I don't know what she's thinking, okay? I don't know where... First of all, there's only 24 hours in a day, so I'm trying to figure out how in the world she's figuring it out. So most people, when you look at them, they're saying, I'm not too fond of this gal, all right? Well, today, I'm going to take a little bit of a different approach to it as we take a look at the not-so-modern family, or not-so-modern mom. If you're at Proverbs chapter 31, verse 10, would you stand with me, please, if you can, in the honor of reading God's Word. An excellent wife who can find. She is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax and works with willing hands. She is like the ships of the merchant. She brings her food from afar. She rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and portions for her maidens. She considers a field and buys it. With the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. She dresses herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. She puts her hands to the distaff and her hands hold the spindle. She opens her hand to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of snow for her household, for all her household are clothed in scarlet. She makes bed coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them. She delivers sashes to the merchant. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she laughs at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teachings of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. May the Lord add his blessing to those words. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for your testimony of what it means to be a biblical woman of God, a person of character, 
One that each and every person here today, whether it's male or female, can look to and say, that's an example that I need to follow. That is an ideal that I need to reach for. And Father, I pray that you will encourage us. I pray, Father, that you will draw us to you. I pray, Father, that you will inspire us to seek to do exactly that, to be more and more like Christ. Thank you, Father. Again, I ask you to hide me behind the cross and touch my lips to give me the words that you would have me to say. And Father, I pray that you'd give everyone here spiritual ears that they'll hear you and not me. Thank you, Father, for loving us. For it's in Jesus' precious and holy name I pray. Amen. I invite you to take your seats this morning. Um, if you pulled out your outline this morning, I told, told Jason about it, you're going to have to listen fast because I got five points. And Jason said, well, that's not bad. I said, yeah, but did you notice that under four of them, there's three sub points. So that's a whole of about 17 points. He goes, man. I said, I know. So you all are going to have to turn your ears on and listen fast because I'm going to go right straight through this. But there's a few things before we get started that I want to point out to you about Proverbs 31. First of all, Proverbs 31 is a carefully composed piece of poetry. It is an absolute beautifully written piece of poetry. This is not written by a husband who forgot that it was Mother's Day and sat down and said, I got to write a poem. That isn't what this is. Not at all. This is an acrostic poem. Now, what is an acrostic? An acrostic is a poem that means that each each letter of the verse starts, it spells something. Well, this uses the Hebrew alphabet. So each line begins with the letter from the Hebrew alphabet. Some of you have done acrostics in school. Everybody knows the old M is for the many things he sees me. That's an acrostic. M-O-T-H-E-R. It just spells mother, okay? Well, that's what this is. It is an acrostic poem, but it is a beautiful acrostic poem. This is a Proverbs 31 woman from A to Z. Now the second thing I want to point out to you about Proverbs 31 is this. This is an ideal woman. This is not intended to be the goal for every woman that is here today. Do you understand that? Okay? This is an ideal. This is like looking at Jesus Christ. Okay? That is the ideal. We want to strive to be like Christ. Amen? Everybody agree with that? That's what we're striving for. Now, how, this side of glory, are we going to achieve that? No. But we're striving for it. The same thing with our Proverbs 31 woman. It is not going to happen. It is an ideal. That means it is not a standard by which men, you need to be sitting there going, I'm looking for this lady, where's she at? Does she meet number one, number two, number three, and number four? No, wrong answer. Do not use that as your standard to try to find the bride-to-be. Now, ladies, listen to me also. This is not meant to guilt you into doing something or to make you feel inadequate, okay? So it is not one of these things where it's like, oh man, I didn't make clothes, I didn't make silk, I didn't buy real estate, I didn't fix dinner, I didn't, I'm, I'm just a failure. No, that is not the case. Again, it is an ideal. So you should not feel guilty because you fail to do everything that the Proverbs 31 woman does, okay? Third thing I want you to see is, men, this is going to shock you. This poem was not written primarily to women. It was written to men. This is not written by a husband to his wife, but it is a poem about a godly woman written to men. And its main purpose is to exhort married men to appreciate the worth of their wives and to give those women freedom to function in accordance with their gifts and talents in keeping with their God-given roles as wives. Do you hear me, men? You understand that? This is about you as much as it is about her. Now, you're certainly going to find an example for wives to follow. But I tell you what, we can learn from this. This is about character for each man and woman that is present here today. You're not only going to learn the character of a godly wife, but we're also going to find the responsibility of a godly husband to enable that godly wife to reach her potential. All right, now you ready? Fasten your seat belts because here we go. The person that the not-so-modern mom is called to be is a woman of great value. A woman of great value. Listen to me, men. The real value of a wife is, is, in her char is not in her charm or her appearance. It is in her character and her excellence. 
Look in verses 10 through 12. An excellent wife who can find. She is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. You skip down to verse 30. It says, Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord will be praised. Now listen to me. There's nothing wrong with charm and beauty. I married charm and beauty. Okay? I'm getting brownie points here, so work with me, all right? There is nothing wrong with charm and beauty, but let me tell you something. Character and capability far exceed beauty. Now, many a man has made the mistake of falling in love with style over substance or a woman's beauty without noticing her character, and as a result, they have paid a price. Now, I debated back and forth whether or not I was going to use this illustration because I figured that I could not win if I did, but I'm going to do it anyway. As an example, Renee and I went to a, a husband and wife par, uh, party where we got together and, and we did a game called the Not So Newlywed Game. You ever, ever heard of that where you get a bunch of old people together and we were young at the time and you, and you played the newlywed game. So we're sitting down there and Renee and I are competitive and we're doing the best we can and the girls are out of the room and they ask us and they're going around, what first attracted you to your wife? So a guy down here, he says, oh, her eyes. And someone said, oh, you know, first of all, this the, one guy was really dumb. He said her personality, you, you know. So, and it's going down the line, and, you know, her, her, you know, her figure. I mean, they just went down there. What, what attracted you? So they came to me, and without hesitation, I said, she drove a forklift. This is a true story. This is not one of those pastor stories, guys. This is a true story. I said, she drove a forklift. And everybody looked at me and said, you've got to be, you're crazy, man. They said, well, you're going to get this one wrong. I wrote, wrote it down. She drove a forklift. Okay. So they bring the gals back in, and they repeat the same thing. And they go, what, what, for, what was the first thing that attracted your husband to you? Oh, my hair, you know, my eyes. And they were getting some of them right, some of them wrong. So Renee, she pauses for a minute. And she goes, does it have to be a physical attribute? And the guy goes, the guy doesn't want to give anything away. So he says, what first attracted your husband to you? She goes, I drove a forklift. <laughs> Needless to say, they were shocked that the two of us knew that about one another. But, you know, and, and now, in all honesty, the fact that she drove a forklift attracted me to her. Let me tell you why. It wasn't the fact that she drove the forklift. It's what that said about who she was to me. Okay? What this said to me was this is a, this is a woman who's strong of character. This is someone who's independent. <laughs> This is someone who's going to be able to take care of herself. You've got to understand, I'm a United States Marine whenever we meet, okay? I'm going to be deployed six months at a time. I'm going to be gone. My schedule is going to be crazy. And I need, the, my spouse needs to understand that. And my spouse needs to be able to take care of stuff if I'm not around because I'm not coming back from the ship to fix this leaky, uh, a leaky faucet. It's not going to happen. So... My idea was I was looking for someone who was strong in character, someone who was independent, someone who could make things happen. And when she told me that she drove a forklift at a pickle factory, I was like, that gal is for me. <laughs> and I proposed on the spot. It was a, it was a little bit later, but, but... So do you understand what I'm saying? I was thinking character. I was thinking what this said about her. And I valued the character more than I valued beauty. See, I knew I was going to get myself in trouble. You don't, you don't understand. She's a beautiful lady. But I was thinking about character. Now, if you look in that verse 12, it says capable or it says excellent. And what that means is that means moral strength her character, her heart, and it's because of this her husband can trust her. If you look at verse 11, it says, the heart of the husband trusts in her. In other words, she's going to be honest. She'll be loyal. She'll be discreet. The husband doesn't have to worry about her. She's not going to be selfish. She's thinking about others. There is a sense of excellence and maturity about her. That needs to be valued. Men, do you hear me? You need to value that. And if you are married to a young lady that has that, then you need to reach over and give her a hug and say, praise God. The second thing that you're going to see is this. It is a woman 
who works vigorously. A woman who works vigorously. The first place that she's going to work vigorously is she works vigorously at home. Look at verse 13. It says she seeks wool and flax and works with willing hands. Verse 15, it says she rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and portions for her maidens. Folks, this is a lady who brings home the bacon and fries it up in the pan, all right? Now, how many of you are old enough to remember that commercial? All right, amen. All right, this is a gal who works hard. It's not glamorous, but it is needed. She is a chauffeur, she's a cook, she's a counselor, she's a tutor, she's a cheerleader, she's a servant, she's a teacher. It's work, and it's a lot of work to be a mom. It's a lot of work to be a wife. And praise the Lord and thank God for all of you that do it. What a blessing that you are. It reminds me of another story that I had with Taylor. She was probably about four years old, and she was always a really bright kid. And, and she always had lots and lots of questions. So she started asking me some questions about marriage. So I was trying to figure out what was the best way for me to share with her what it was to be married. She's a visual learner, so I went and got the, went and got the wedding album, and I started pulling it out. And I took it out there, and I brought it out, and I opened it up, and I pointed out to her mom, who was is, who is, who is coming in her bridal outfit, you know, in her wedding dress. And I said, you see that? And I saw the reception and, and the recessional, and I looked at all that, and I showed her the pictures. And I looked at her, and I said, now, now do you understand? Now do you understand? And she looked up at me and with those precious baby blue eyes, and she said, yeah, I get it. That's the day mommy came to work for us, isn't it? <laughs> it's hard work being a mom. All right? Think about it this way, though. It's worth it if Jesus Christ is in it. Because, you see, it is her delight because she's doing it as if unto the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31 says, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, okay, you get that? Whatever you do, you do it all for the glory of God. Above the kitchen sink in Ruth Graham's home, there was a sign that read, Divine services held here three times a day. Right above the sink. So every time that she was doing dishes, it reminded her that she was fulfilling the ministry that she had been called to to support and help and minister to her family. And she did it in the name of Jesus. Not only did she work vigorously at home, but here's an amazing thing. She worked vigorously at the store. Look at verse 14. It says she's like the ships of the merchant. She brings her food from the altar. This is not about convenience. That is not important to this woman. She is a shopper. She is a planner. She goes the extra mile. She's looking for what the best deal is for her family. You see, back in those days, in order to get what you needed, the merchant ships, you needed to plan ahead. So if you knew, you needed to know when the merchant ships were coming in, when they were getting there, you needed to know what you needed to get right then and there. So you needed to be a planner. This Proverbs 31 woman is a planner, and she is not driven by convenience. Not only does she work vigorously at home, not only does she work vigorously at the, at the store, but this 30, Proverbs 31 woman works vigorously at a job. In verses 18 through 19, and 24 through 37, and 18 and 19, it says this, She perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. She puts her hand to the distaff, and her hands hold the spindle. In verse 24, it says, She makes linen garments and sells them. She delivers sashes to the merchants. Verse 27, She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. These verses describe a career woman. This is bringing home the bacon. She is busy. She's buying. She's selling. She's trading. Folks, listen to me. The Bible does not condemn a woman for working outside the home. As a matter of fact, she is commended right here in Scripture for doing what's needed to provide for her family. If you are fortunate enough, if you are blessed enough as a lady, as a woman, to not to have to work outside the home, praise the Lord. Use that blessing to minister to your family. Use that opportunity to share Christ with those that are there. But if you need to work outside the home, then you work outside the home. 
And you should not feel bad. You should not feel like you're failing as a wife or you're a bad mother. No, you are a good wife. You are a good mother because you are doing what is necessary to provide for your family. It says so right here in Scripture. Before we move to the next point, I want to pause just for a minute. Remember we talked about character, okay? So don't sit here and think, see, see, honey, are you listening to this? Are you listening to this? No, 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 men, are you listening to this? Because this plus stuff applies to you too, all right? You need to recognize the value in that woman. You need to work just as vigorously as she does. You need to be paying attention because this applies to you as well. The third thing I want you to see is this is a woman of vast wisdom. A woman of vast wisdom. Look at verses 16 through 18. She evaluates a field and buys it. She plants a vineyard with her earnings. She draws on her strength and reveals that her arms are strong. She sees that her profits are good and her lamp never goes out at night. This speaks about her wisdom. And I want you to three, see three aspects of her wisdom from, this, from these scriptures right here. First of all, it says that she evaluates a field and buys it. She knew how to make investments. She was financially wise. You need to see her financial wisdom right here. Can a woman do that and be a good mother? You better believe she can. Amen, she can. Now, as you read the rest of Proverbs 31, verses 10 through 31, what you're going to see, though, is this did not come at the expense of the home. It was an extension of the home. Her first priority was always her home and family, not her finances. She was financially wise. We need to be financially wise. She was also physically wise. She had physical wisdom. Verse 17 says that she draws on her strength and reveals that her arms are strong. We already know that the Proverbs 31 woman is not a lazy woman. But I want you to see something. She takes care of herself. I strongly believe that verse 17 is talking about her health and exercise. She took care of herself. If you are going to do all these things that are being lined out in verses 10 through 31, you need to be in good shape. You need to be healthy. So listen, folks, we need to be physically wise and take care of ourselves. These bodies are what? They are a temple of the Holy Spirit, and we need to be taking care of them for what? For the glory of God. The third thing I want you to see from this is she was economically wise. She had economic wisdom. Verse 18 says, She sees that her profits are good, and her lamp never goes out at night. She knows how to handle a budget. She makes sure that there is no wasting of money. She plans ahead and she makes sure that her family gets what it needs. It says that her lamp never goes out at night. Now, that does not mean that she stays up all night. Although, I am married to a lady that will stay up all night to get the job done if necessary, okay? But that's not what this is talking about. This is referring to the fact that she had purchased enough oil ahead of time that she had enough that that lamp would never go out. And she would never run out of oil. She knows how to run the business of the family. She anticipates the, what her family will need ahead of time, and she makes sure that it is there at the home and that the needs of the family are supplied. This woman has a vast amount of wisdom. Next thing I want you to see is this woman is a woman of great virtue. A woman of great virtue. Her hands reach out to the poor, and she extends her hand to the needy. She is a woman of compassion. She's not thinking of herself. She's thinking of others first. She's reaching out to take care of those in need. She's not selfish. She's not taking care of herself. She's worried about others, and her ministry is to others, not only to her family, but to those outside the family. Think about the impact that this woman is having on her children, on her husband, on her church, on her community, because she's demonstrating a compassion for those that are in need. 
Not only is this a woman of compassion, this is a woman of character. Verse 25 says, strength and dignity are her clothing, and she laughs, laughs at the time to come. Folks, this woman isn't just clothed in fine linen and purple, but with strength and honor. What does that mean? That means that she is clothed in dignity. She has an inner strength. She is emotionally, mentally, and spiritually strong. This is not an emotionally frail woman. And under stress, she can smile at the future. She can rejoice in the time to come. You know why? Because she knows her God. She knows Jesus as her Lord and Savior. She knows who to trust her trust and faith in, and she has placed it in her God. Folks, if we are going to follow this example, then we need to know who holds tomorrow. We need to place our trust and faith in Jesus Christ. We need to lean on Him and not trust on our own understanding. This is a woman of character. Not only is she a woman of character, but she is a woman of counsel. Verse 26 says, She opens her mouth with wisdom and teaching of kindness is on her tongue. You know why? Because in verse 30 it says, She fears the Lord. This is a woman who, according to Scripture, has taken God's word and written it upon her heart that she might not sin against Him. This is a woman who's following what God has laid out before her. She is a woman of great counsel. You've got a woman here of great value. You've got a woman here that, that works vigorously. We've got a woman of great virtue. And then finally what I want you to see is I wanted you to see this woman's incredible, valuable witness. Look in verses 28 through 31. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also. And he praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful. Beauty is vain. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands, and let her works praise her in the gates. This is a woman who has an incredible witness and a testimony of God's greatness in her life. She is a blessing and a witness. And she's a testimony and a witness to three specific groups of people. The first group, she is a witness to her children. Look what it says in verse 28. Her children rise up and called her blessed. Moms, listen to me. They may not stand up and call you blessed today. I know there was many times when I was a kid growing up, I did not stand up and call my mom blessed. But I stand before you now, 40 some odd years later, praising God for a mother who was faithful. Praising God for a mother who raised up a child in the way that he should go, that he would return to it. Praising God for a mother who brought me to church every time the doors were open. Praising God for a mother who prayed with me. Praising God for a mother who told me later on in years in life that she used to follow me to school to make sure I went to school. I kid you not, I didn't know this, but she, would, she said she'd get in the car, because I'd walk to school, she'd get in the car and she'd trail me to make sure that I got to school and where I was going. I did not know that. Praise God for that woman. Praise God for that woman who spanked me when I needed to be spanked. Praise God for that woman who worked extra jobs so that we could have extra things that we really didn't need. Praise God for that woman who put food on my table. Praise God for that woman who loved me. Praise God for that woman who drove me to the hospital when I broke my arms. Most of all, praise God for that woman who prayed for me every single night that I would come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Listen, moms. They may not raise up and call you blessed today, but if you follow the ways of the Lord, they will. They will. You need to be faithful with your witness. Not only is she a testimony, a valuable witness to her children, but she's a valuable witness to her husband. Verse 28, and it says, Her husband also, and he praises her. Listen to me, men. You got a good wife. You need to give her a paycheck of praise and admiration every single day. Okay? 
I don't know when the last time you told her it was that you loved her, but I can guarantee you that it wasn't soon enough. I don't care how many times a day you tell her you love her, you probably have not told her you love her enough. You need to tell her over and over and over again how much you love her, how much she means to the family, and how much you appreciate her, and how proud you are to call her your wife. You need to let her know. I believe an illustration of the woman says a lot about her husband. Because, listen, we're talking here about the Proverbs 31 woman. When was the last time you prayed for your wife? When was the last time you prayed with your wife? When was the last time that you did something for her that you could free her up so that she could be all that God has called her to be? Folks, we need to praise her as she follows what God has called her to do. The final area that she's a valuable witness to is she's her, is her witness to her community. Look what it says in verse 31. Give her of the fruits of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. People in the community will talk about her and when they do, it will be about how wonderful of a woman she is. Folks, you are a valuable witness to this community. Okay? Let's face facts. When I got here to Mount Zion, I came from Kansas City, Missouri. And there was over a million people in that area where I lived. Okay? It was not uncommon for me to go to Lowe's, the grocery store, and go through there, and I'd see somebody, and I'd never see him again. I'd probably very seldom see him at church. I came here to Mount Zion. Town of, what, 6,000 people? There, give or take, thereabouts. I go to the grocery store, I'll probably run into one of you. Okay? I, I, go, I go to Huck's, I'm going to run into one of you. Okay? I go to Culver's, I'm going to run into Bill Benton. <laughs> My point is this. My point is this. You are a witness in a community. Every single one of you are a witness in this community. You need to be reflecting Jesus Christ to everyone that you encounter so that they see what light is like, so they understand what salt is like, so that you are a witness and a testimony to what Jesus Christ has done in your life. And just when you think you're about to let something go because no one is looking, I guarantee you somebody is. It is important that you understand that you are reflecting Christ Jesus. You are a valuable witness, ladies. Men, you are a valuable witness as well. This morning is Mom's Day. I thank God for a mom who, she, she didn't hit all these spots. I can guarantee you she didn't. And I could sit down and tell her that, and she'd go, oh, I know that, what are you telling me? But you know what? She strove and strived to attain each of these ideals. So don't sit here this morning, ladies, and feel inadequate. This is a guide, it's a goal, this is an ideal woman of God. But it is one that you can aim for. And men, listen to me. You got a mama who's like this, you better put your arms around her and say, I love you and thank you. Men, you got a wife that's like this, you need to put her arms around her and say, I love you and thank you. They are valuable. And you know what makes them so valuable? They know Jesus. They know Jesus. You see, you cannot be a good son, a good daughter, or a good husband, or a good mother without Jesus. Jesus. You can be an okay one, but if you want to be a really good one, you need to know Jesus and experience the life-transforming power of the blood of the Lamb. If you're here this morning and you recognize that you have a need for a Savior, then you need to come and know Him. All you've got to do is say, Father, forgive me. I'm a sinner. Please be the Lord of my life. 
If you're here today and you're sitting here and you're a woman and you're sitting there thinking, man, I'm falling short. What's your relationship like with Christ? Do you need to know Him? Do you need to rededicate your life? What about you, men? Do you reflect these characteristics? Because you should be reflecting these characteristics as well. If you're falling short, then you need to rededicate your life and say, Father, forgive me. I want to be like you. Do not leave here today having, not enc and having encountered the living God, Jesus Christ himself, and not leaving changed. He's here for you.